Welcome back to Curbside Consults. To introduce myself, I'm New Voice and a new face that you can't see. I'm Mirthula. I'm one of the New England Journal of Medicine editorial fellows who will be doing the podcast this year, along with Clem and Leslie, your two favorite hosts. On the show with us today, we have Dr. Sherry Blauet, Chief Medical Officer at Spalding Rehabilitation Hospital and Associate Professor of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation here at Harvard Medical School. Both from a personal and professional standpoint, Dr. Blauet is a leader in the disability advocacy community. I'm going to hand it over to her to tell us a little bit about what she does and what motivates her on a day-to-day basis. Over to you, Dr. Blauet. Well, thank you very much. Um, And first off, thank you for having me on the podcast. This is just really an honor and a great opportunity, so I appreciate it. As was noted in the introduction, in my current role, wear a couple of hats, as many of us do in academic medicine. I am, first and foremost, a clinician in the specialty of physical medicine and rehabilitation. In my clinical work, I uh, provide sports medicine and musculoskeletal care to athletes and active adults across the spectrum. On the administrative side, I serve as the chief medical officer at Spalding. So, of course, involved in leading our physician group, thinking about priorities related to quality and safety and patient experience, our regulatory requirements, et cetera. And then in my research and advocacy, that's really where I dock in quite a lot with the uh, disability advocacy community. I'm a retired Paralympic athlete in the sport of wheelchair racing, and I myself am a wheelchair user as the result of a spinal cord injury when I was very young. And my life experiences, which have been quite diverse, (laughs) as I know is the case probably for many listeners as well, have really given me a passion for both ensuring equitable care for patients with disabilities, but also in terms of my research interest. My career as a Paralympic athlete has really dovetailed into maintaining involvement in Paralympic sport and looking at the efficacy of physical activity and sport opportunities for people with disabilities, as well as sports injury prevention in elite Paralympic athletes. So I have quite a sort of academic blend, (laughs) but it's all very much meaningful to me and couldn't imagine it any other way. It's incredible how all of these varied features of your journey seem to have sort of met together in your current practice, Dr. Blowett. Could you tell us a little bit about sports medicine? How did you get interested in your professional journey to where you are now? Sure, I'd love to. So of great interest, as I noted, I acquired a disability at a young age. Um, I actually grew up in the Midwest on a, a family farm in Iowa and was involved in a farming accident at 16 months of age that resulted in a spinal cord injury. So I have self-identified as a person with a disability in my entire life. Being from a fairly rural part of the country, as I moved into elementary school and then middle school and high school, I obviously was constantly seeking opportunities that would be a good fit for me as a person with a physical disability and initially gravitated towards a lot of um, more sedentary activities all great things like, you know, band and student council and so on and so forth. But I had this really breakthrough opportunity in middle school when I discovered the world of adaptive sports, which is sports that are catered to people with disabilities. And I started to get involved in our local community and sat out opportunities at the regional level and ultimately at the national level and continued very slowly but surely to gain skill in adaptive sport kind of started to drill into one specific sport, which is wheelchair racing. And by the time I went to college, I actually had quite a high level international career in this sport. So certainly not what I had planned for my life journey, but really the result of continuing to, I guess you could say, roll through open doors as they presented themselves. So um, I went to undergrad at the University of Arizona. So I made a big journey from the Midwest down to the desert Southwest. And a lot of that was due to the fact that at that time, there were very few universities that had adaptive sports programs, and I wanted to continue to compete. And um, Arizona was really thoughtful and proactive and really ahead of the curve in terms of developing these programs for students. So I headed down to Tucson and continued to pursue my athletic endeavors. And as I enrolled and started into coursework, was really obviously thinking about my career journey and ultimately decided to pursue pre-med training and then ultimately to apply to medical school. So my educational journey has always been that of having that identity of student athlete. Sports were always very intertwined with everything that I was doing, even in my academic work. And ultimately, I continued to compete actually through both undergrad and through medical school. 
after finishing undergrad at Arizona, I was very honored to be accepted and, and then matriculated at Stanford School of Medicine in the Bay Area of California. And I continued to compete all through med school as well. I took two extra years to complete med school because I took a few leaves of absence prior to some of my major international competitions like the Paralympics in 2004 and 2008. And then when I was nearly finished and ready to graduate from medical school, I had also then been competing for about 10 years internationally, and I was emotionally ready to retire from elite sport as well. So I hung up my racing jersey. And as I was graduating medical school, and that then opened things up geographically to really do residency wherever I felt was the best fit in terms of my clinical education. And that's when I came out to Boston for my internal medicine year at the Brigham and then my residency in PM&R at Spalding. So that was my educational journey. Now, for the first part of my career as a faculty member, honestly, I felt like I continued to seek opportunities to maintain my experiences and my broad network in sports to build my portfolio academically. And so through the early part of my faculty career, a lot of my research and publications were focused on this world of Paralympic sport and thinking about elite athletes with disabilities and how we promote health and safety and think about acute sports medicine needs in that population. And then given my clinical specialty in pm and I've also always understood the public health imperative of that. And so also ensured that we were looking at what was the experience of just people from the general community who have disabilities and the importance of physical activity in preventing chronic disease and other issues related to sedentary lifestyle. So I think when I retired from sport, I always knew that I would never really be able to leave that part of my <laughs> of the world just because being an athlete was such a critical and core aspect of my identity for so many years. So I have always sought ways to bring that identity forward and continue to be involved now academically in that space and to promote these sport opportunities for underserved populations like people with disabilities. Well, to be a medical student itself is a full-time job. To be a student athlete as a medical student, I'm sure was more than a full-time job. But to do that with disability, could you talk a little bit about what some of those particular challenges were like? It's a great question. When I was an undergrad and I was thinking about applying to medical school, at that time, there were not a lot of places that I could look or seek information or understand what to expect of the experience. As I was exploring options, I, of course, sought out connections and contacts for other physicians with disabilities so that I could understand what their training journey was like. But frankly, at the time, there weren't very many. So if I were to say how many physicians who were wheelchair users across the country, I think I could count it on two hands. And so there wasn't a lot of like formal mentorship or associations, organizations where I could link in and start to receive mentoring and understand sort of what my experience would be like and how to self-advocate or what may be some of the adaptations I could consider. So I was really carving my own path along the way. And Stanford, where I went to medical school, I feel fortunate because looking back, honestly, they were very open-minded and they did something that at the time I didn't really appreciate, but now in retrospect, I understand was so important. And that was that they approached the discussion about what my needs would be and potential accommodations as a bi-directional conversation where I never got the sense of them sort of telling me what to do or imposing a solution on me, but rather we knew that we were carving a new path together and we were all going to be learning along the way. And so even from the point of matriculation, we started to meet regularly. I had a point of contact in one of the associate deans that I could go to regularly for any questions or concerns. And we looked at my training schedule and started to think ahead about what might be needed or what would be helpful to ensure that I was successful and then work together to create that positive environment. So I could say, I think there were both challenges, but also a lot of opportunities there. I think as long as you're being treated respectfully and people are approaching it as a conversation and approaching it with curiosity and a sense of learning together, then I think it can be done. I think... One thing you mentioned, Dr. Blowett, was the importance of mentorship, finding people who were supportive of your journey and who could help you sort of strategize or think through challenges that arose, whether related to your disability or otherwise. Can you talk a little bit about sort of some of the stereotypes that you encountered or times when people were perhaps skeptical of your ability to succeed? 
I think the status of the disability community and the broader disability rights movement has really advanced quickly across both the U.S., but also internationally over the last several decades. And so the stigma and stereotypes that people with disabilities experience, I think, have changed over the years and are certainly less prominent now than they were maybe 50 years ago. But they're still out there. These stigmas and biases are deeply entrenched in our culture and in our thinking and how we're trained to think when we're young. And so there is still a lot of misunderstanding about disability across society. And that, of course, impacts any student or anyone going through clinical training, as well as, frankly, faculty members as well, because it's not like if you become faculty, these challenges just go away, right? Yeah, that's true. And so there's still a lot of misperception about disability. I think the the biggest one that's still a challenge for anyone with a disability, whether it's a physical disability or a different type of disability, is that having a disability is a lesser way of living, right? And that disability is something to pity or to look down upon. And the reality is that we're, we're really trying to reframe that way of thinking and to reframe disability as a ubiquitous part of most people's life experience and not something to be pitied or be looked down upon, but rather simply another personal characteristic that creates a valued element of diversity. So people with disabilities, if provided the opportunities and accommodations that enable them to be successful, are ambitious and creative and bring a really interesting lens into their work. And that should be seen as a valued aspect of diversity that we want to be a part of our working environment, just like we seek diversity in so many other ways. So that older way of thinking still is so pervasive, particularly, I would say, I have personally noticed a big generational difference where folks from older generations who grew up at a time when people with disabilities were not empowered in society see disability very differently than younger generations who have grown up in what we call this ADA generation, which is people who have come of age and learned how to see the world after the ADA was passed in 1990 which really opened up society for people with disabilities in a totally different way. And young people now have disabled friends. They have disabled coworkers and colleagues in school. And because of that, you create personal relationships. And through those relationships, you think about disability in a totally different way. And so in general, I think that we still have a long way to go, but that we're coming along. And when I experience bias in my environment, what I experienced as a student and what I continue to experience as a faculty member typically still reflects those older ways of thinking where people may look at me and pat me on the head and say, oh, I'm so proud of you to be here. Or gosh, I can't believe what you've been able to do. But they approach it with more of a lens of pity and sort of thinking about it from a charitable perspective as opposed to seeing me as an empowered professional. Another way to think about modern concepts of disability is comparing points of view of what we call the medical model of disability versus the social model of disability, or now even considering what we call the human rights model of disability. And these models have evolved over time. But the short story is that when we think about disability through the medical model, we are thinking about people and we're thinking about their identity based in their medical diagnoses. And in that way, we're thinking about the flaw as inherent to the person. And we as a medical community, if we can't heal or cure that person, then we feel like we failed. And what we're trying to do is replace that medical model that is, of course, very prominent in healthcare because that's where it stems from. That's where it started. And we're trying to take the healthcare community and the medical community out of the medical model, actually, and instead encourage people to think about disability through what we call the social model, which is frames disability as inherent in the environment. So essentially, through the social model, we think about people and people have varied personal characteristics, but how much disability they experience on a day-to-day basis is actually a result of their environment and how much their environment accommodates them in order for them to be successful. So if you take me as an example, I am a 42-year-old woman and I'm a faculty member at Harvard and the CMO at Spalding. And if you think of me through the medical model lens, then you would look at me and you'd define me as a middle-aged woman with a spinal cord injury who can't walk and has, you know, multiple medical comorbidities because of that spinal cord injury and somewhat of a high risk patient. And when you think about me in that way, I don't sound very empowered, right? (laughs) 
Whereas if you look at me through the social model of disability, you would see me as a 42-year-old woman who's a wheelchair user who is able to successfully work and pursue her career as an associate professor at Harvard Medical School and the CMO of Spalding. And I'm able to do that successfully because I drive an adaptive vehicle and I work in an accessible environment in our hospital where there are ramps and elevators and automatic door openers that enable me to be successful. And in my environment on a day-to-day basis, I'm not disabled at all. I can do everything that I need to do in order to achieve my goals on any given day. So we're trying to really frame our thinking more towards this social model where we understand, again, that disability is a natural part of human diversity, and we can empower people with disabilities through reasonable and thoughtful accommodations so that they can achieve their goals in life. And in that way, when we see deficits, the deficits are actually in the environment, not inherent to the person. And when we think about the deficits as being in the environment, then we are much less likely to have bias towards the person. So I hope that's clear. You know, I'm not a sociologist, but that's my my, uh, my take on it. And I would just tack on to that, that if you talk to leading disability rights advocates across the country, what they'll tell you, which I would also very much support is that we're now moving beyond the social model and we're talking about disability more through the human rights model, which essentially places it as being completely equivalent to any other rights-based issues for underserved communities. So in the same breath as we think about being an anti-racist society, we should be thinking about being an anti-ableist society. And we need to think about our structures and things like structural ableism and the way that that oppresses people with disabilities across society and think about the structural solutions that'll help us get beyond that. I think that there's still a lot of fear and reticence out there towards approaching people with disabilities with the curiosity that's necessary to learn about their lived experience and their preferences. And so the first thing I'd say right off the bat is that I think for any person with a disability, please talk to them, (laughs) learn from them. And if you approach it with curiosity, I promise that it will be met with gratitude. Regarding disability, things have evolved. Where we're at currently really is that there are two primary ways to think about disability and disability, the language to describe disability. And there is not complete agreement across the disability community about which is better. And so frankly, people are encouraged to simply state their preference. The two primary ways of describing the community are through either a person first lens or an identity first lens. So if we use the person first framing, then we always lead with the person and then describe their disability. So I would be a woman who is a wheelchair user, for example, or a woman with a disability. If we instead think about describing the individual or the community through identity first language, then the identity leads. So with that framing, I would be a disabled woman, or I would say I'm a disabled doctor. And there's a lot of, I wouldn't say disagreement, but I would say active debate across the community regarding which is preferred because some people feel like the identity first language is more empowered, that we should not be afraid of our disability or seek to hide it in any way. And that by using identity first language, we are the most proactive and forward thinking about bringing forward that identity with pride in a way that helps to reduce stigma. I grew up in the 80s and 90s. And at that time, if I would have framed myself with identity first language, I do think I would have experienced more bias So I think my lived experience leads me to prefer person-first language. I prefer to be referred to as a woman with a disability or a doctor with a disability or an athlete with a disability, but I recognize and very much respect the differences in opinion around that. One thing that's really important to mention is that those really are the two preferred ways to describe the community. We're really trying to move away from other types of framing that promote ongoing stigma and bias because they try to hide the disability. So when people are afraid to say the word disability or disabled, that in and of itself tells us something, right? Like, why are we afraid to use the word? (laughs) So we try to avoid things like special needs or differently abled or very much older ways of framing it that now are even seen as almost being slurs, like crippled or handicapped or retarded. So I would say to listeners and those that you're interacting with, don't be afraid to use the word. Don't be afraid to say the word disability or disabled. If you're talking to an individual or describing the community, say in your academic writing, think about whether you want to use identity first or person first and simply note the why. 
or frankly, what I do in my academic writing is I actually use them interchangeably so that I represent both points of view in any manuscript or paper that I develop. If you read any of my recent pieces, you'll see that I go back and forth between disabled community or people with disabilities, for example. Well, and that makes perfect sense. Just as with any other community, it's made up of individuals and individuals may have different feelings or identities that they hold to themselves. And so I think your original point about approach with curiosity really would allow people to have those conversations and to know how best to address their colleagues who have disabilities or who are disabled. Another first point or another initial point I'd make is that now increasingly medical schools will have a point person on staff who is really there to work directly with the students and to kind of be that liaison between the student and the faculty member or the senior resident or anyone else will be providing that supervision in a clinical environment to stay ahead of it, to make sure that even in advance of the student starting that rotation, that everyone's prepared and on the same page and feels comfortable. And also understanding what are the laws and regulations that we need to keep in mind as we provide accommodations. I'd say that some of the things that I see being put into place at different institutions across the country that have been helpful fall into a few different categories. First off, if you look at the literature about the disability identity of medical students across the country, some of the most recent papers, which are now only a year or two old, and they're pretty high quality work. The lead author on those papers is Lisa Meeks, who's on faculty at the University of Michigan and really a leader in this space. And the most recent papers will tell you that the most common disability identity across medical trainees in this country is actually non-visible disabilities. So learning disabilities um, or mental health disabilities. So things like dyslexia or ADHD or significant mental health diagnoses that may lead to the student having certain accommodations that would help them to be successful. Because we should all remember that mental health is covered under the Americans with Disabilities Act. So that is a definable disability. So important to note that most of the disabilities that you'll encounter in medical trainees are, you won't see them. (laughs) They are uh, non-apparent disabilities. If you then go from there, um, falling in prevalence far under that are physical disabilities, like, for example, working with wheelchair users or people with ambulatory disabilities, and then sensory disabilities. So students who may be low vision or deaf or hard of hearing, for example. And as you can imagine, the accommodations that will ensure success for each student very widely dependent on their disability characteristic. For students with physical disabilities, it's typically obviously thinking about the built environment and whether the clinical training environment enables them to move uh, freely and quickly and to be able to get from point A to point B and where they need to be at any given point in time. Uh, Thinking about things like parking are really important adequate space in the clinics, um, ensuring that things are positioned low on the wall so that you can reach, for example, the gloves or the otoscope, making sure computer height is acceptable to be able to document appropriately and efficiently. And then for individuals with sensory disabilities, um, accommodations are typically more so in things like, particularly for people who are uh, blind or low vision, thinking about technology solutions. So screen readers for computer use where you can download software, that will read the screen to you rather than you reading the screen yourself, large print materials for lecture materials, voice amplifiers for those who may have, who may be deaf or hard of hearing, that type of thing. So (laughs) there's no one size fits all approach. And again, it, it very much goes back to individual discussions with the student regarding what their needs are. That makes sense. And I think, again, the focus on making the environment as adaptive as possible really helps to reframe this discussion from what can't the individual do to what can the environment do to help support the individual. Absolutely. Well, I think, like you said earlier, being the first is always difficult, but it also puts you in a unique position to look back and see how things have changed and to also look forward and see what change is yet needed or what change is yet to come. Looking ahead to the next 10, 20 years, what do you think are areas for continued growth for supporting colleagues who have disabilities? I think one area that we've, that's yet to really be explored and talked about in a lot of detail is the experience of faculty with disabilities. I think that the rapid evolution that I described in my earlier comment has really focused quite a lot on students. Um, and for all of the right reasons, <laughs> like that's where the work needs to start is creating an equitable environment for students with disabilities where again, where they can be successful 
and the environment enables a successful experience. That said, we're really just scratching the surface of what is the experience like when you then launch your career and you are working as a faculty member, if you're in an academic environment or as a clinician in a different environment, private practice, for example, and what is that experience like and what are the unique challenges at that level of your career? I think as it relates to faculty, one of the biggest challenges that we still face is, well, I'd say a couple of things. Number one, again, because obviously the demographics of physicians and clinicians across our country, of course, mirror the demographics of society. And we all are aware that we have a very rapidly aging population with our baby boomers moving into older ages. And we know as well from broad epidemiologic data that you acquire disability as you age. And so I think we're frankly very underprepared for the disability experience of physicians who acquire disability simply because of aging and how we frame that and how we think about that. I think that there is still significant fear and stigma within that group, within that aspect of our profession, where people are still not comfortable disclosing disability that may be acquired later in life. And we don't have good systems to encourage disclosure and then support people after they've disclosed in a way that reduces stigma and, again, promotes more of a social model of disability. So I think we're doing a great job and have great momentum as it relates to the student and trainee experience. We have a long way to go as it relates to the faculty experience and the experience of people who are currently more advanced in their careers on this topic. That makes a lot of sense. I think it's an under recognized or and underappreciated additional challenge of trainees who come into training and then stay on as faculty who then develop illness. The hand of illness touches all of us at one point or another. And some of us just have that experience when we're not expecting it. And so I think being able to have some of these conversations in the open, as it were, I think is critical for all of us, not just for those of us who have had the experience of disability from a young age, because really we're all equally human as and equally susceptible, isn't it? That's exactly right. And what we learn from each other and the accommodations that we put in place to help people be successful helps all of us, right? So case in point, I had a colleague of mine who was an orthopedist who experienced, who had a, he had a bad fall on ice and fractured his ankle and had to have his ankle immobilized for a period of time. And um, it was actually quite a severe fracture. And so had to initially use a wheelchair for a few weeks and then sort of one of those kneeling scooters and then crutches. And he, he reached out regularly and he said, gosh, at MGH, there's this really heavy door to go into this certain part of the hospital. And on my scooter and crutches, I simply can't open it. How do I ask for an electric door opener to be put on that door? <laughs> and I pointed him in the right direction. And I think the change was made, but now look like that door is now accessible for everyone. So I think that, again, if we understand that disability is a nearly ubiquitous part of our life experience and understand that what we learn as individuals will make our environments better for everyone, it's just totally reframes it. And it reframes it in such a way that is really empowered and, again, really minimizes stigma and helps us to understand that we're all here to help one another's success and facilitate one another's success. And that we'll all be the better for it. Well, and I think that brings it back to to the importance of advocacy, of being aware of what's happening so that when we're in a position of being able to advocate for a change, we can, your orthopedic surgeon friend has opened doors literally for other people coming behind. So I think knowing that resources are there and advocating for them really does have an impact on the whole community. It does. Absolutely. Well, I think you've given us so much to think about. And a lot of great conversation openers for us to really think about how we, as a medical community, can think and act to create more opportunities for people with disabilities of any type that's particularly affecting that individual. Thank you so much, Dr. Blowett, for spending some time with me this morning and for sharing your background, your history, your journey, and things for all of us to think about. I think it's been incredibly educational and very useful to all of our listeners. Thank you, Medulla, and thank you for the opportunity. I really enjoyed it. Well, that wraps up this episode of Curbside Consults. I'd like to thank Dr. Sherry Blowett for joining us today to discuss physicians with disabilities 
in training and beyond, as well as disability advocacy. We are always looking for ways to improve our podcast and educational materials. So if you have any comments or suggestions, please leave us a review on iTunes or email us at resident360 at nejm.org. We would also like to form a focus group to get more formal feedback. So if you're interested in participating, please email resident360 at nejm.org. Our production team at NEJM Resident 360 includes Karen Buckley, Lynn Winston Perry, Kyle Simmons, Mike Thomases, Tim Vining, Scott Williams, and Kathy Stern. Also, a special thanks to our NEJM Education Editor, Dr. O.P. Hamnick. Curbside Consults is brought to you by NEJM Resident 360, a product of the NEJM Group.